Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Very good day to you. This is Pregnancy to Parenting. Welcome to our show. We'll be with you for the next hour or so. So sit back, relax as we discuss once again nutrition and something that I think is imperative to discuss every single day. In fact, if we could have an entire season just on nutrition, I would, and a few seasons, in fact, because every day we eat, every day we make choices on what we need to eat and how we need to eat it. So we, we have uh, Kath McGull from uh, Nutripedia and Studio back with us, pediatric nutrition, um, dietitian, nutritionist. <laughs> Always get confused with the two. Although I'd like to know the difference between, you know, dietitian and nutritionist. Maybe you can explain that to her. But a warm welcome back, Kath, and thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Thanks for having me back. <laughs> that was something I was thinking about mm. last week, I think. And, um, you know, is there a difference between a dietitian and a nutritionist? There is actually. There's okay. actually a different registration for them. Right. Um, a nutritionist and a dietitian would probably do similar um, consults and give mm -hmm. it similar advice on the outside. The difference is a dietitian can work clinically in a hospital okay. um, and work with clinically ill patients, mm. whereas a nutritionist is not registered to do that. Okay. Yeah. So more of a lower level. <laughs> Yeah, it's just different. So just a different focus. So, yeah, okay. yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you for that. I always <laughs> wanted to know. But, you know, we, we touched on last week, very interesting, picky, fussy eating. Mm. I know at least one stage in our lives, our children go through that, um, that of not wanting to eat this and not wanting to have that. And um, But latching onto that, and before we do move on from picky, fussy eating, anything else that we just need to recap of what we where we left off and just also just to just to enlighten us on, on what was left where we left um, last week last time we spoke on uh, picky fussy eating I think the most important thing the message that we wanted to kind of bring across last time was that don't go into battle with okay. your picky eater it is a normal part of phase a normal part of development mm -hmm. in the toddler years it's kind of encompassed with ego development and they're separating okay. themselves from mom and one way to do that is on the nutrition and feed inside okay. because that's played such a vital role. Moms mm. feed their babies in the womb, they feed their babies at the breast, they then feed the baby mm -hmm. and so when the toddler wants to kind of distance himself or herself from her mother which is a very normal stage and a healthy part of development one way to do that is often with food and that's often why a picky eater will be eat beautifully around others but mm. most difficult with mom um, or with dad so I think that is the one thing is to understand that it is normal it is a phase and if you relax in it and don't go into battle it will probably fast mm. uh, just fades out and pass okay. um, but if you do go into battle you can prolong it okay. and invariably it's not going to be pathological or really a detrimental to your child you need to trust your child that they won't starve themselves so leading on from picky eating and fussy eaters uh, we're looking at lunch boxes um, and also preschool nutrition how we can best combat and uh, not allow that to be another battle for us Correct. that's today's discussion and topic but please enlighten us on how that too does interlead if it if it does even um, yeah, I think what often happens is once your toddler goes through that phase you mm -hmm. kind of get the eating back on track and their moms are shocked a bit when around four or five years their child becomes picky again. Okay. But again, that's another developmentally normal phase. Mm -hmm. And that's actually got to do more with the physiological makeup. So at that point, physically, the child's body does not demand the same amount of food mm. that the child's body would demand when they were a little bit younger or when they are a bit older. So they almost go through a lull, metabolic lull, where mm. they don't require that huge volume. And it can tend to be perceived as picky and fussy. Okay. And so that is also quite normal. But a challenge because now you've got a whole lot of other factors that are involved mm. and other influences in your child's life. Now let's discuss um, toddler nutrition and how different that is from when you, uh, at least not, not toddler nutrition, sorry, preschool nutrition and how, how different that is from the toddler, uh, what the toddler requires. So from a volume point of view, there's not a huge difference in volume and that's also sometimes quite difficult for a parent to understand. Mm. So what the toddler's portion sizes doesn't necessarily increase dramatically when they become preschoolers. So okay. there might be a slight increase, but you generally find that, like I said, the body doesn't demand a huge amount, so it pretty much stays the same. Mm. And they tend to eat small portions 
um, also quite frequently because their little tummies are really small. Okay. So from that point of view, there's not a huge difference. What is different though, is that it's the food is generally not just in the home environment mm. anymore. So they have opportunities and they are, are required to eat elsewhere. So during the day and their three meals in the day, at least mm. one of them will generally be eaten in a different environment. So your guidance on helping our child have um, a good balanced uh, diet at that stage and also where does the lunch boxes and the, the influences of us you know eating out um, mm. come in all of this? I think one of the, the challenges is often by in the toddler years you can still keep your child away from the sweets and the treats and all that but okay. by the time they get to the preschool years that's near impossible. Mm. You're starting to have loads of party invites, you've mm. got play dates coming up, You've got, as you say, lunch boxes. Not only does your child take a lunch box to school, but the rest of the class takes a lunch box to school. Mm -hmm. And so they're exposed to other people's way of eating. And so suddenly their food could look unappealing. And when they're exposed to the treats and the packet of chips and the odd chocolate here mm -hmm. and there, it's very easy to almost get into that um, kind of natural way of saying, well, at least they've eaten a packet of chips. I often have parents coming into my room saying, my child's a picky eater, but I'm just happy even if you eat a packet of chips it doesn't matter and that's actually the wrong approach to take. We mustn't forget that nutrition is still critically important to this age group and never never as the only last resort because at least they've eaten. Mm. So what we do notice is that when we remove the junk food and the treats and the fast food out of their diet to a large degree they actually start becoming less picky because their bodies want to eat foods and want to eat energy because that's how they survive and so they will start to look for it in healthier options if the alternative is not available. While the alternative is available it's actually very difficult to entice them to eat the carrot or the apple mm. or things like that. So the varieties that we're, t we're talking about um, and also that challenge of what is available is not necessarily um, introduced in your own home but in fact like you say they see it at schools it's influences mm. around them um, and it's and it's and it's kind of difficult you know disciplining them when they're not with you mm. so do schools and what sort of boundaries should schools and teachers have at, at this stage I think schools have a big responsibility to create in a safe food environment mm. and that's in two aspects firstly safe from treats and high sugared processed foods and they can do that by having a very simple lunchbox policy okay. that they can draw up as a governing body or as a teacher body mm -hmm. and um, it's not difficult, it's not a high tech concept mm -hmm. but they could use possibly like the robot system where I've assisted schools with that where we've kind of got your green as your go foods and that can be included in the lunchbox every single day okay. and there can be a variety and that would obviously include all your fruits and your vegetables and your good proteins and mm. your dairy, good dairy products. And then you've got your orange list and that could be, you could have possibly one of those in the lunchbox okay. um, every day, but only one. So mm. you wouldn't be able to have two of those. And then the red list are the kind of no-go foods and those would be allowed possibly say only on a Friday or those would be allowed if there's a party in the school. Okay. Um, so something like that. So they would include obviously your more treat foods. It's interesting when you say the no-go foods, but you're still allowing it. Yeah, so they're the foods that you don't want every single day okay. in the lunchbox, but they are reality because life yes, happens yes. and there is going to be that party. Mm. So if in a class time they know there's a party, or Baker's Day mm. is a popular thing in schools, but also I think for schools, I challenge schools to look at different ways to do Baker's Days mm. and different ways to celebrate birthday parties. So that, because sometimes you might have four birthday parties in a week and you can't have four times of having, say, cupcakes in the week. So maybe there should be a combining of maybe birthday parties for the month okay. as one treat day in the month. So there's different ways. We just need to think about out the box. Mm. And if we start to just really think about it and focus on it, there are ways that we can really eliminate and reduce the amount of those sugary mm. foods in the environment and um, which makes it much easier for parents when packing the lunchbox for school. Looking at the sort of message that schools should be telling kids through your experience and I don't know how far that goes with regards to schools, you said mm. you've worked with one or two schools, does it come from 
um, you've mentioned the governing body, does it come from government itself? Does it come mm -hmm. from implementation of the teacher? And which do you think is a message to um, our parents today to take back to their schools mm -hmm. that it should be starting? I think actually in, I've, I've worked amongst many schools and in different environments, both mm -hmm. from the private sector and the government sector. And at the end of the day, it's the parents that actually drive it. Okay. So it's a group of parents getting together and saying, we demand this, we want this, can mm -hmm. we work together with you and can we assist you? Mm -hmm. And schools generally are very open to it, if you're willing to assist, because it's a lot to implement. I've had moms come in and kind of take over the tuck shop so that they can ch change the way that the tuck shop is run. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously there does need to then be buy-in from the teachers and um, from that but generally I find the driving force behind it whether it's government or private mm. actually comes from the parents themselves wanting it. Okay we touch more on lunch boxes and treats and what should be in those lunch boxes some tips from Kath McGaw our dietitian pediatric dietitian in studio with us and we want to carry that message across as Kath said you know parents it starts with you um, lunchbox treats and packaging and what you're putting in your lunchbox, you know, influences that child, uh, your, your friend's child, um, the friend of your child, and you know, the message needs to be clear. And at the end of the day, we need to help each other as a community. Often it's said, you know, we uh, it takes a community um, to raise a child, and it absolutely does. Stay tuned as we talk more on lunchboxes and uh, preschool nutrition after this. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back. Today on Pregnancy to Parenting, we're discussing lunch boxes and preschool nutrition. Nutrition, eating, drinking, something that we do daily. And uh, next time you're doing it, you're picking up a glass of water or you're sitting and having a meal, think about what you are really feeding yourself. Think about where it came from. And uh, often I hear the saying, if it isn't alive, then it's probably not good for you. We're not now talking about meat and things that needs to be cooked. But the saying goes something like that. In studio, we have dietitian Kath McGaw, who's also just released a new book, which we, um, we're touching on as well, as she talks some great handy advice in there. Um, but where we, where we um, left in the last segment, lunch boxes. Some hints and tips, and you've mentioned the, the robot rule. Um, and we as parents, it, as much as there's that information out there that we read and we Google and we have mm. these books, um, there's nothing really substantial in our faces uh, that, we, that can guide us. And of course, mm. it's the choices that we make. So help us understand that when we are packing lunch boxes, that is the first port of call we're mm. thinking of. We're thinking of what, what sandwiches are we packing? Mm. What type of bread mm. is it? Um, are we thinking that way? Because mm. it's just easier than it's just easier picking up a loaf of bread mm. and putting some sami or whatever cheese on there and making mm. a sandwich for our kids. So, so talk about talk about what it is that we should be thinking about when we are packing lunches, and just some tips on that. So the first thing when packing lunch boxes, before you even decide what you're going to put in, mm. the, the thing is that if you're going to pack this fancy lunch box, but your child never eats what's in their lunch yeah. box, then it's a waste of your time and energy. So the first thing to establish is you need the buy-in of your child and there's two ways that you can do that. You can either get them to sit with you and plan their lunch boxes for the week okay. um, or you can get them every day to pack their lunch box with you so that and eventually they can start packing their own lunch box mm. within some guidelines once you've shown them how. So that is very, very important is obviously the buy-in and it can start really early. You don't have to, the earlier you start actually the better because then it becomes a way of life that they are part and participate in packing their lunch box. And besides the nutritional advantage of them actually buying in and eating what's in it, there's also that responsibility that they take on and eventually you'll be off the hook and won't have to pack lunch boxes anymore. But if, if we are getting them involved in packing their lunch boxes, one can only imagine 
um, what the lunch boxes are going to be look like, <laughs> looking like with treats. So, firstly, let's uh, if we could maybe look at the options of to yeah. them and, and trying to influence them, and how do we put that across, and what are the so good options? obviously the boundaries, just like we spoke about in in toddler and picky eats in toddler okay. nutrition and picky eats, and same with the lunch boxes. You set the boundaries at okay. the end of the day. That's your responsibility, and you can you can have it in quite a fun way. So you can kind of say, well, we want to have say four colors in our lunchbox. Okay. So the minute that you add color to it, you're going to need to include fruits and vegetables. So it can either be color in the form of a fruit or color in the form of a vegetable. And it can cut up fruits generally work better for lunch boxes. Okay. And squeeze in a little bit of lemon juice just allows it to not yeah, go brown. I remember I cut fruit yeah. up and my, my daughter said, oh, this one looks like yucky. Yeah, <laughs> so I think you just have to be careful what you cut of what you choose. Yeah. Otherwise, to get bite-sized fruits, like, for example, your blueberries or your grapes okay. or your strawberries or something that you can just take. Be careful of things like cherries with pips in. They can be very oh, dangerous yes, okay. to, to send to schools. So um, try and stay away from your pipped fruit, mm -hmm. but try and use your kind of easy to pop in the mouth fruit. Remember that kids are busy, they don't have a lot of time on their hands, they want to play, and so lunch boxes need to be eaten quite quickly. Mm. Um, and generally at this age group though, at schools, they generally have a lunch box time, they all sit around, yes. open their lunch boxes together and at least try things. So mm. the first thing is you want to include something of color, so that will be your fruit or veggies, so they can choose from that. Then the second thing they can choose from is from, say for example, a dairy. Yes. So, and that could include a piece of cheese, um, either the size of a little matchbox, um, and preferably a white cheese would be a healthier option. It can include a little yogurt, can include a little um, drinking yogurt that mm -hmm. they take with, and so that can be then added into the lunchbox. Then you want to include a protein food, um, or you can include either a cheese or a protein food, okay. um, depending on what what is and what, are, what are the options for protein foods? So protein foods? foods could be, for example, um, a piece of cooked chicken okay. that you've had from the previous night before. Mm -hmm. And that normally works quite well. I do that if I cook up a whole ch roast chicken, I'll shred some of it up and put it into the lunch boxes for the okay. next day. The other thing that I quite like to do is to cook up some um, just some nice sausages and then just give okay. them little bits of sausage um, in their lunch box um, or little kebabs that I, we make and then I normally freeze them. Another thing I make and freeze is like little meatballs. Mm -hmm. So anything that can be popped in the mouth mm -hmm. is quite nice. Be careful of too many cold meats that are full of processed you know, processed meats. Okay. It's fine to go for your less processed meats. And, and sausage, is it yeah. not? Process, yeah, so just choose the type. I'm not talking about the Viennas. Okay. I'm talking about your kind of good quality um, sausages, mm -hmm. either your chicken or your beef or your lamb sausages. So something that hasn't come up there is bread, which okay, we often so give to our kids. Yeah, so bread, bread is something sometimes that you can't always get away from because it is fairly easy mm -hmm. um, and quick to eat, and it is fairly filling. Um, there are some children that really don't, their bodies don't do well on lots of bread, so okay. I would try and keep it not as the main part of the lunchbox, but as it can be as a small part of the lunchbox, okay. or it could be some provitas or some crackers. Okay. Um, cracker breads, it can be a little bit of pasta, some kids love that, mm. to pick up some pasta from the night before can actually mm. work quite well. I was quite surprised when my elder said to me, actually he would love leftovers from the night before for his lunch box mm. and he was quite happy to eat them cold. cold. So, <laughs> yeah, and, and I hadn't actually thought of that no. or thought that he would even consider that. So that's why I'm saying engage your children because they might just surprise you as to what they say, they would actually consider in their lunch box. And, and it, it could also just make your life a little bit easier instead of thinking of what you're going to be having for breakfast or lunch the next exactly. day. Exactly. Preparing extra dinner yes, or supper exactly. uh, in that meal. Exactly. And then, and then it's there for, for, the, yeah. for the leftovers for the next day. So if you are going to do bread, try and go with your more low GI bread, so okay. your bread that's got some good fiber in it, mm. so not pearly white bread. And um, try and go for least processed bread that you mm. can find. You get in a lot more options of like potato bread or sweet potato breads that are available now. Even even in your mainstream supermarkets, okay. you don't have to go to all these fancy health shops and spend a fortune. Mm. So just spend a bit of time around the bread aisle. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised that, especially at the different stores that have their own bakeries, what okay. they actually are producing. 
So, so you're saying go to the su supermarkets and get the breads that are la labelled, because as as we know, la breads are labelled. The pearly white bread, you know, it's got lots of bran and fibre sure. in, um, and you confuse it. Oh, they're saying it's just it's a low GI yes. white bread. Yes, I think. exactly. So do, do we trust that, um, no. or are we going for the bread that are uh, browner? Yeah, you vegan? definitely want to go for bread that's browner and that looks more close to what it resembles in nature. Just okay. like you started off your comment, like living food. That's mm. really what we want to put into our children. Okay. And then onto your bread, you would either put some, if your school allows it, some mm. nut butters either your almond nut butter or peanut butter you could use because that's a lovely form of protein mm. and a healthy fat. If your school is nut free because of allergies, then you might want to put some cheese on it. Um, you might, if your child's happy with it, put some egg on it. Some okay. children don't like that and understandably so. <laughs> some children don't mind. Some children love to take a boiled egg to okay. school. So again, it's just engaged with your child. Know that you have yeah, to it is. It is always <laughs> such the same with fish. So yeah. those are might be two things that you decide to rather leave for lunches at home. <laughs> but um, otherwise, you could put a bit of your shredded chicken on it okay. with a little bit of mayonnaise or another form of sauce. So just yeah, just be or, or some leftover mints from the night before if mm. you were making that for supper. So just think about different ways that you can if you add protein in the form that we've spoken about, mm. either in your leftover meats or your pre-prepared uh, meats, like your meatballs that you've frozen, okay. um, those are quite nice. Another thing that's actually nice, if we're talking about egg that doesn't create quite the same kind of mm. smell potency that a normal egg would do, is little quiches, mini quiches, okay. that you can actually make in like a cookie pan. And it's actually the easiest thing to do. You just whip up some egg, maybe cut up a little bit of, of meat in, or just put a bit of grated cheese in it, Put it in your little cookie pan, bake it in the oven at 180 degrees for about 15 minutes, and then you've got a whole tray of 12 that can kind of be put in this Mini omelet. container. Yeah, just little like little egg cupcakes, yeah. and you just pop one in a lunchbox. Okay, and so do that recipe for us quickly. So, just you, so you would just whip up, for, I think for about 12, you would yeah. need two eggs okay. that you beat up and add about a tablespoon of milk to it mm -hmm. and you can add about a quarter cup of grated cheese okay. if you want to you white can do cheese. white cheese mm -hmm. if you wanted you could do some cut up tomato as well but okay. if your child doesn't like that you can leave that out and anything else you would like to add in and then you could just pour it into a muffin pan that's greased mm -hmm. pop it in the oven at 180 degrees for about 15 minutes and then you can take it out and then you can freeze it or you can just put it in your fridge if you've got a few kids that are going to be eating from it and take one a day and pop it in a lunchbox. I have lots of kids, so I probably <laughs> use like <laughs> half a dozen <laughs> eggs, something like that, because they will gobble it up. My kids yes. love eggs. And, and I like that recipe because I know if you if you put put it in a muffin tray, it kind of makes its own crust. Correct, um, exactly. So you don't I've need, you don't, it's crustless. Yeah. And um, it's very filling, Shapes and, everything, and yeah. it satisfies them for quite a while. And you can hide some goodies in and there. And you can, you can definitely hide some grated carrots or some grated baby mm. marrow or something. I like want that. to talk about the sauces. You've mentioned the sauces, and we haven't even gotten to the mm. five p uh, golden rules. But quickly, um, before we take a break, how can one make? Because um, my kids love tomato sauce. Okay. Um, and I've seen the option of rather taking buying a, a pasta sauce, which mm. is which is a richer tomato, mm. or making my own sauce. Mm. What would be the better option? Yeah, well, you can use tomato paste, mm -hmm. which is actually got sugar-free. The big thing with sauces that are already prepared, like, mm. like a tomato sauce, is that it always has sugar added. And some of them even have high fructose corn syrup, yes. which we really don't want, and we've spoken about mm -hmm. that. So if you're going to make your own tomato sauce, you can use either your, like you say, pasta sauce, that, mm -hmm. but be careful because some of them also have sugar added to it. Okay. Or you can take the, the tomato, I use tomato paste, mm -hmm. um, and then that actually works quite nice if you add just a little bit of water to make it a little bit more runny. Oh, yeah. And I've added a little bit of honey just to sweeten and take that okay. tartness off a little bit. Honey. And that actually works quite well. Okay. And if you combine that with the mayonnaise, you get some really nice mayonnaise, oh. or you can make your own. Um, tomato sauce and mayonnaise. mayonnaise mixed together. Oh, yeah, okay, but actually, it I, I want to talk more on that. This has got got us uh, chatting <laughs> about uh, an, an interesting topic and some recipes. And when it comes to recipes, we that's kind of our forte. Stay with us as we continue this topic on lunch boxes and preschool nutrition. Back in a moment.
Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back. We're in our last segment. Oh my goodness, time has really fl- flown by. And we literally want to cover as much as we can. But if you if you need a guide, get a copy of uh, Kath's book. Um, we'll have it up in, in a second or two. But thank you so much for staying with us. And just before the break, we were talking about um, some recipes and lunchbox ideas. And it's so quickly for us to take out of the fridge some chutney, some um, tomato sauce, and spread it over the, 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 um, the meal or the lunch just to make it a little bit interesting. But uh, a combination of tomato and mayonnaise, I know I would usually do that when I'm making a braai marinade. You put all the sauces together, but not really thinking of that. Some tomato paste, um, honey, um, to make your own tomato sauce and some mm. mayonnaise. I, I do, though, buying um, buying even uh, tomato sauce, always add a little bit extra water mm. just to, you know, mm. let it, not just let it go further, but sometimes uh, it, 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 it does uh, it doesn't do much to it also mm. if you add a little water mm. and it thins it out whatever mm. sugars and mm. all the nasty stuff that are, yeah. that are in there but um just as, as a tip for us because now we want to move on to you know the so, sort of social mm. environment mm. that our children are exposed to we spoke about you mm. know them being exposed to other children's lunch boxes schools friends mm. birthday parties um, and we want to look at some tips on, because um, now they're at the stage where they are going to be inviting, mm. being invited to lots of birthday parties and play dates and um, even at school. So just guide mm. us on t- for parents um, with regards mm. to that and you know, thinking of not just your child but other kids mm. as well mm. um, and sometimes limiting uh, you know, the sweets and the, the, mm. the party stuff just kind of makes you stuck. Like, what mm. do you actually do? Mm. I think that's always a challenge and obviously it's a fun and a new stage mm. when your child starts getting invited to parties and that. So I think it's also been a bit discerning, you know, if you've got the kind of class environment where everyone gets invited to everyone's party, mm. you might need to just make some decisions as to which ones you go to or how many parties you go to on a weekend. You know, running from one party to the next and covering four parties over a weekend is, is unrealistic and it's also just not it's tiring and mm. exhausting besides the whole nutrition aspect as well um, but you know I really encourage parents to look at parties a bit differently what are you actually wanting to achieve at a party and one of the things that you really want to achieve is that get together okay. it's the kids connecting so you know include a lot of games and keep them busy and, and sh- keep parties short mm. they don't have to go on for four hours you know, you can always, if, if grandparents and family come over, that can kind of be an extended um, time. But with the kids, the actual kids' party, where there are all these kids, at this age group, they can really cope with socializing for a, bit, for a maximum of about one and a half to two <laughs> hours. And then they start getting ratty and mm-hmm. tired and fighting and that. So, so limit your parties to about one and a half to two hours. Engage them in a lot of activity and interaction so that they're not bored and just hanging around mm. the, the sweet table. And then just rethink the sweet table and also possibly the timing of the party. So maybe make parties more closer to meal times, maybe like okay. a brunch party if you want to do a more morning party, do it closer to breakfast time. I encourage mm. parents that you're doing a brunch and serve those little mini quiches like we suggested and maybe some vegetable chips in the book. There's a lovely recipe on uh, making your own vegetable chips using other Are they tasty? Potato. They're delicious, okay. absolutely delicious. All these recipes have been tried and tested on my own kids oh, okay. and patients, children. <laughs> so it's really been well, well tested yeah. and, and looked at because we obviously want them to enjoy, enjoy it. it. So yeah, um, or do it over lunchtime, mm. a lunchtime party, and you can even do like a mini braai. For example, so can you make your own sausages and vihannas? You can, you and, and you the can do that, that absolutely. And you can do that using, for example, mince. Okay. And you can use either ostrich mince, you can use chicken mince, okay. you can use lamb mince or beef mince, and you can combine it to thicken it with some egg, um, or you can thicken it with a bit of ground oats. Mm. And so you take away the heavy flour and all the starches so and that sort of thing, and you can roll it. And um, I've even done one party where the kids actually made their own. And they actually then cook their own um, sausages. Wow. And though that worked really, really nicely. Or we made little patties at one party. So also getting the kids involved in preparing their food okay. just kind of draws out the, the food part of it. And they're engaged in food, but they're not spending all their mm. slim time eating. Because I know another thing kids love is pizzas. Mm. And uh, do making a pizza yes. is actually one of those easy uh, And it foods. is, and it's fun. And you can make the bases really thin. You can mm. use even wraps as bases. For wow. example, because that's really thin, so it's not lots of starch mm. um, that goes, and you can add then your cheese to it and your toppings, and they can pick and choose. 
and you can either just pop it in your oven or if you've got a pizza oven use that um, and so there's yeah there's different ways but getting them engaged in the food is really really nice all of these sounds a lot like not a f i mean when i come from my community and, and, and we have meals at a time they don't quite sound like a full meal mm. how is it that that we know that our kids are going to be filled at the same time and, and enjoy the, their food and not wanting to be hungry again an hour later well, when they're at a party, when they're at a party, even mm. packing their lunches, um, what are the portions? And I know the the, yeah. the rule of thumb is your fist. So yeah, so the fist. So basically, by this age group, they kind of need in from they need in a bit of protein and they need in a bit of fat mm. and in the form of the different nut butters and um, different form of, for example, avocado, mm. um, olives, um, and things. And dairy also contains some nice fat, so including dairy is also really nice. Um, and then include in a healthy starch mm. would also be important okay. to include. Healthy starch would yeah, be. so that could be anything from your um, your pasta, okay. your rice, your couscous, could be quinoa that you use in. Okay. It could be a healthy piece of bread. So just depending on what you include in there. In the, in would the would it be a good idea to maybe turn up those breads, um, especially those nutty breads and like the, those whole grain breads, low GI, maybe into croutons that they would enjoy and how can we make that not, you know, healthy for them? Yes, you can definitely do that. So you can you can cut it up and you can just braise it in a little bit of um, some oil. healthy oil like okay. olive oil, for example, or even coconut oil, which mm. is a really good fat to cook in as well and very healthy for them. So there are different ways that you can do that and that will sustain them and, and keep them going. I've heard um, parties from friends and then coming back, just as feedback, oh no, they went to a tofu party. It was the only popcorn party. Okay. Um, but it, what was interesting is that uh, the parents was like, they they cringed and they thought it was strange mm. but yet the children enjoyed themselves mm. so it was surprisingly different mm. um, but the children were able to adapt to it so mm. how how is it that sometimes our own mm. disciplines and and uh, issues mm. that we have are holding us back from feeding mm. our kids the proper foods i think i think a lot of the time it is our own misconceptions and our own perceived things that children want sweets and that mm. children don't really they want to have fun that's really what children want and that is why often kids won't even eat half the stuff that mm. is at the party. So normally what I suggest is, is focus on the savory um, and then ink make your cake, because the cake is fun and it's blowing out. Make that as your sweet. And what you'll okay. find is often then the kids will eat the piece of cake. Because mm. what often happens is the so much sweet and that the cake just gets left behind and yeah. you get these pieces of cake that you've spent a lot of time on or you've spent a lot of money on and it just gets left all over. So, um, yeah, just relook at, at how you do that. Cupcakes are actually often really nice to serve because mm. it's a, it's a bite-sized piece and it can be mini cupcakes mm. and that they get. And these single, single party um, food parties are actually quite fun. Like you say, with the popcorn party and all mm. different shapes and sizes and all different fun things done with it. And it can actually be really fun and engaging. And it's not really your responsibility unless you're saying, you provide in lunch, or you provide in brunch, you provide in yes. supper to make sure that the kids are full up. It's really your responsibility to make sure that they're safe, mm. that they have fun at your child's party, and that they're not overfed on a whole lot of sugars. And that just brings me to the last thing with parties is the party packs. You know, yes, that's become that's something that, that kids really, they, they insist on, they demand, they kind of ask before you <laughs> even arrive, mom, is there going to be party packs? And it that's really true. doesn't have to be sweet. Mm. It can be a little... It actually doesn't have to be anything. Mm. I think that expectation has been created. Mm -hmm. But should you so feel that you need to give a party mm. pack, do it as, as something that they can, a little notebook or a little pen or a little yes. book of stickers or something like that. Food, yeah. It doesn't have to be food, really. Do the moms a service and not send the kids home with more sweets. Chocolate. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, what are your complete no-nos when it comes to, because one thing that you haven't mentioned is fruit juices and jellies mm. and um, maybe treats like desserts and ice creams. Mm. We literally do have a few minutes left, um, but I'm so glad you, you touched on the party back mm. issue thing and I, and I found that popcorn is a big, big thing. Mm. Kids actually enjoy it and mm. it's so healthy. Yeah. So don't um, not want to put popcorn on your exactly. table. Exactly. Uh, and, and, and do different things with the popcorn mm. as well. But um, specifically on that, on, on the, the fact that which you want to eliminate, so at least mm. you know don't go there. Mm. What what are those items? Yeah, I don't 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 offer fruit juice. You know my okay. feeling on fruit juice is just really not necessary. But mm. iced teas are really nice okay. and homemade. 
So not the iced teas that are full of sugar that are commercially bought because mm-hmm. they've got as much sugar as your um, other fizzy drinks mm-hmm. and as your fruit juices. But a homemade tea, and it's also cost effective, and choose some really nice um, tea bags with some lovely flavors, like mm-hmm. apple and cinnamon are lovely flavors and very well received by kids. Infuse them with a lot of tea bags so that they're quite strong in their flavor. And if you need to add a little bit of honey to it okay. and cool the tea down, add some ice to it and it's extremely refreshing and can last. And have lots of water around and available. And you'll find kids will often go for the water because and that's I've really lovely. And I've noticed even in the water, just having people over, they just infuse a little bit of mint and Absolutely, um, or even cucumber fruits. even. Yeah, yeah, and cut up fruits mm-hmm. um, like mm-hmm. strawberries mm-hmm. and, yeah. and yeah. apples and that sort of thing. And left, left there for a while, they actually bring a lovely flavor. We literally have a minute left, but I want to touch on to how um, it is that this leads into the next show we want to mm-hmm. look at, and that is you know, kids uh, being exposed to certain foods and how it affects their bodies, one mm. being concentration issues. Mm. Yes, I mean, we've got a lot of children these days that have uh, been told, you know, by the schools and by the, the, medi- by the medical profession mm. that their child needs to either go on medication or their child has got issues around concentration um, and may need therapies, for example. And there's definitely a way that in the, the environment, from a nutritional aspect, we can support these kids better. Mm. And I'm really looking forward to the next show where we'll be able to look at how the different foods and the different food groups and the way we feed our kids can actually either help or hinder Mm. their concentration. So definitely looking forward to having Kath back. Thank you again once once more for um, the very important uh, information you've given us today. The name of your book again? It's Real Food for Happy, Healthy Children. There we go. Real Food for Happy, Healthy Children. Get a copy right now and and, and there's loads and loads of pages with recipes, lunchbox ideas and anything from newborn, toddler to where we're at today is preschool nutrition. But stay tuned to our next show as we look at um, concentration issues, ADHD, breaking them down and how it is that nutrition can help that. But we have a special insert after this, so don't go away. But for now, from myself, Hawa Solomon, wassalamu alaikum and good day. Welcome to this pregnancy journey of our show host Hawa Solomon as she takes you through her trimesters during her pregnancy. Today, gynecologist Dr. Malika van der Schaaf confirms her pregnancy. Okay, Hawa and Riyad, congratulations on your little pregnancy. Everything is looking fine on ultrasound scan. Pregnancy is where it's supposed to be. We've got a beautiful little, almost three centimeter little baby with the heart rate going well, everything looking fine. And that definitely confirms with and confers with your dates that you are in and around nine to 10 weeks and nine and a half weeks. So that's for you, for the photo album. Um, And then, from now, what still needs to be done is I just need to double check um, all the other pregnancies before. Now, I know it sounds horrible, but nausea actually is what you want to hear. You want to hear about nausea and misery because then it means the pregnancy is growing, alhamdulillah. For all intents and purposes, if all goes well through the pregnancy, that's exactly what we anticipate. I would recommend that you get to the hospital earlier because since it's not your first pregnancy, it might go faster than the others were. So don't hesitate at home for too long. If waters break, get into hospital earlier. And then um, the only thing we would do during the pregnancy afterwards is watch out that you don't end up bleeding excessively. But for now, while we're still in the first trimester, what... Heartbeat is fine. I'm happy with that. And your dates and your ultrasound scan match, which is exactly what you want to hear and is in the correct place. So from here, um, the only other thing I also need to know is which multivitamins you're on at the moment. I would recommend now for the first trimester is adding to that folic acid is a general pregnancy multivitamin. You can choose a pregnancy multivitamin that also has a combination of omega-3 and 6 because that's always helpful and healthy for the baby. As far as your iron supplementation is concerned, I will do your blood tests now also to check around that. So I'll tell you about that now. But maybe while you're feeling nauseous, not to add an iron supplement just yet. But the minute the nausea goes, which 
for all intents and purposes, inshallah, should be for another month once the first trimester is done in and around 13 weeks. So in around a month's time, you should start noticing the nausea going away. And from now, it should slowly be going away. So what I would recommend is definitely choosing an iron supplement. And then just one of the side effects of your iron supplement is just to watch out for constipation. So I would say dietary wise, just keep, you know, things in your diet that would a lot of that's filled with fiber and that can help. What we do need to do before your next visit is do your antenatal blood screening. So what we do for antenatal blood screening, there's set antenatal bloods that we do. One of them includes doing your full blood count and that's going to tell me whether you're anemic or not. And based on that, if it does come out that there is anemia, I might recommend that we do your iron levels as well to see how anemic you are. So that, we also then check your blood group. I'm not sure if you're familiar with what your blood group is. No. We also then check to see is your blood group rhesus positive or negative are there any antibodies or anything to that so we do that and then the other tests that are included then is to check for infections and those would be um, the infections we check for for example is syphilis not a very common infection sexually transmitted silent and easily treated with penicillin but can affect the baby really badly especially in the second trimester so that's why we check for that now um, we also check for whether or not you're immune to German measles so that if any of the kids contract German measles or you come into contact with that we know whether you're immune or not because that can affect a pregnancy really badly um, within the first trimester or in the third trimester and then the other two tests we check for is for your infections which would be hepatitis and HIV HIV, which as you know are your big um, sexually transmitted and also acquired infections that can happen. So we would often ask your consent as well just to check for HIV because it changes the way the medications you'd have to be on, changes your birth method that would have to happen whether or not you're breastfeeding or not. So those are the tests that I would send you for and um, would automatically test for. Little assessment ultrasound scan is a level three ultrasound scan, meaning it is a specialized fetal abnormality test where they will check um, to check for generalized fetal abnormalities, but in the first trimester, they check for Down syndrome. So what happens is when your child is laying in a position like a little bean, um, preferably like this position that we have here, we measure the thickness behind baby's neck because Down syndrome babies tend to have a thick neck and that's why it's called a nuchal thickness scan. So Down syndrome babies have a thick neck which is genetic and also sometimes a sign of heart failure. We also check that it doesn't matter how flat you think your nose is, 80 to 90 percent of Down syndrome maybe have either a very short nasal bone or they've got an absent nasal bone. So they look at that. They have a small jaw that runs into the chin. They've got a specific heart murmur that can cause heart failure as well. They've got a short upper arm, short upper leg and problems with fingers and the way it looks that they look for. So that along with a specific blood test that happens within your 10th week they will enter into the computer along with your age, your ethnicity, your weight, your family history, all of that, and then they will give you a risk ratio. So they won't be doing an amnio until they, it's a non-invasive test to give you a risk ratio to say, are you at high risk or low risk? It's and just a only scan. it's a detailed scan, absolutely, where they also look at everything from head to toe, where they can look at isolated abnormalities, but they also look specifically in the first trimester for Down syndrome, and in the second trimester when organs have grown and are bigger and they can visualize better, they look for isolated abnormalities as well in the second trimester. And then, um, as I said, if they give you any risk ratio to say that they are worried about anything, they will talk to you about further tests that can be done, whether it is further blood tests that need to be sent overseas or whether it is that they take some blood or fluid from around the baby. That would be in and around the 13th week so that would be in about three weeks time that we'd schedule you for that and then see you after that with all of the results and your blood test and blood results. If we look at your dates and at everything we're looking at around about the middle of August so in and around the 15th of August inshallah this year and because this is not your first pregnancy there is a possibility that you might be delivering anywhere from the beginning of August to around about the middle of August because that would be your term versus 
the 15th of August is your full term due date, which ideally we'd like to not see you go beyond. Join us again over the next few weeks as Hawa invites you to be a part of her pregnancy journey. Don't forget to follow and comment on the Pregnancy to Parenting Facebook page. Pregnancy. Thank you.